We are starting a new series today. It's called The Temptation Matrix. I'd like to say, uh, first of all, thank you to Trevor for covering last week. A great job. Um, yeah. And uh, I know that some of y'all were not able to partake in the, um, the other trinity of graham crackers and marshmallows and uh, <laughs> things like that because you were on the Daniel Fast. Uh, but uh, the Daniel Fast has been great. Uh, thank you to all of you who are participating and fasting and praying for our church. And, um, you know, I hope that you were able to benefit from the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, you know, we're talking about temptation. And probably those of you who were doing the fast, you were probably tempted maybe more than you have been tempted in a while. I know I was tempted having given up meat, uh, which I don't normally do. Uh, being a vegetarian is very challenging. Those of you who do it, I applaud you, um, because on uh, Friday, when it was the last day of the fast, I'm thinking, well, I could probably eat at six. <laughs> and then I was like, no, 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 I got to make it all the way through. It's not the day's not over until midnight. And so I didn't eat until Saturday. But I had chicken wings yesterday, and they were great. <clears throat> but you know, the thing about it is this, is that you don't really appreciate or understand temptation, right, until you're really trying to focus on the Lord. But when you are focusing on the Lord, you're going to be a whole lot more aware of the temptations that are coming toward you or that are around you, right? And, and so we want to explore this thing of, Temptation over the next uh, three weeks, and just called it Temptation Matrix uh, because you know the Matrix is they're re, they're coming out with number four sometime uh, soon, and and uh, and and so you know when I started thinking about just temptation, it is it's kind of like you're in a whole other world, and if you haven't seen the movies, uh, you're aware of this guy named Neo, who. Uh, his word, yeah, his name actually can be, the letters can be transcribed to mean the one. And, and, and the thing about it is this, is that when you are in this other world, when you're living otherworldly, when you're living for another kingdom, you see things differently. And uh, Neo is faced with this challenge in the first matrix where uh, Morpheus comes to him and he offers him these two pills and, and offers him and says, you know, you've got to make a choice. You, you take one pill and you, you kind of forget everything. Uh, or you take the other pill and you go down the rabbit hole and you kind of realize that there's this whole other world, this whole other dimension that's going on that you're not quite aware of otherwise. And you see, when we become followers of Jesus, it's like we've taken that other pill and now we, we see, wow, there is, there is a spiritual world. There is other things out there that we are not always consciously aware, aware of. And yet, when you become a follower of Jesus, your senses to that spiritual world are heightened. And oftentimes, you're going to be tempted. Now, I'm, I, I was tempted this week. Were you tempted this week? How many of you in this room were tempted this past week? Yeah, I think all of us could probably say, in one way or the other, you were tempted this week. You probably had something come at you, maybe that you weren't expecting. Or maybe there were temptations that you deal with every day. And sometimes, we have that. There, there can be daily temptations. There, there are things that you may... You, you find out really how tempted you are whenever you do. You give up donuts. <laughs> and then you come to church and you're like, man, I'm tempted. Every Sunday I come to church, right? <laughs> Some of you, you realize, wow, you know, this wasn't really a problem until you really said, no, I'm not going to have that or I'm not going to do that. And then all of a sudden, what is it? You crave it. You want it, right? Because you said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore or I'm not going to entertain that anymore. I'm not going to participate in that anymore. And all of a sudden, now, everywhere you go, you see it, right? It's just because your, your spiritual awareness is heightened to that. And, and so I, wanna, I want you to understand today uh, a few things about temptation. If you want to, turn over to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at uh, just the first couple of verses there. I want to define what a temptation is for you uh, because there are a lot of different ways that maybe people would define it. I would define it this way, that temptation is trying to fulfill a God-derived desire 
in a non-God prescribed way. That sounds fancy. Let me put it even simpler. It's you trying to fulfill something that God has put in your heart in a way that God, that doesn't honor God. Okay? So a temptation is when something's offered to you that everyone else might say, hey, it's just natural. It's just instinct. You should just go ahead and do it because, I mean, it's just who you are. And it might be something that God has put in your heart. But when we try to fulfill that desire in a way that God has not prescribed for us, drugs can be good, but if you're taking a prescribed drug in a wrong way, it becomes abuse. And then that abuse, what? It can lead to death, right? We all know this. And so temptation is taking something that God has maybe put inside of us, but trying to fulfill it in a way that God did not ordain. This is why, you know, we can, let's just say, take the big, you know, one of the big ones, sex. Hmm? Gonna talk about sex in church? Yeah, right? Sex is not a bad thing. God created it. God has ordained it. But when we try to fulfill that desire outside of what God has prescribed in His Word between a man and a woman, it becomes detrimental. Right? This is, this is what God has prescribed. But when we try to fulfill those desires outside of what God has prescribed, it causes problems. With a big P and a big R, O, B, L, E, M, S. Right? Big problems. Right? So you've got to be, you, you don't be surprised when things don't work right, when you're not following the way God wants it to be done. It's not going to work right. Ever. E-V-E-R. Ever. Right? It's just not going to work right. And, and so we have to understand that temptations come to us when the evil one, when the evil one is trying to say, hey, you have this desire. Even God gave it to you. God gave it to you. But don't follow the way God wants you to do it. Because God's holding out on you. Why would God tell you not to do something? I mean, if He's a good God, why is He telling you you can't do something? Listen, you have parents. And your parents tell you not to do certain things, not because they don't love you, but because they do love you. When they say, look both ways before you cross the street, that's not because they're mean. Even when you're going across a one-way street, look both ways. Because you've got some people who don't know how to drive. <laughs> right? You look both ways because people don't know how to drive. It's not that you're not where you're supposed to be. They're not where they're supposed to be. So when you're making friendships, look both ways. Because you might be thinking, oh, wow, you know, they say they're a Christian. They say that. Just because somebody says they're a Christian don't mean they're a Christian. And just because someone says they're following Jesus don't mean they're following Jesus. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. And this is what Satan is really good at doing, is telling us what we want to hear. And then a lot of people will take the Bible, and people are skilled at this. They can make the Bible just like you can make statistics look like anything you want to. You can poll people and take surveys and you can get any kind of data you want from it. People are good at taking the scripture and just kind of twisting it and making it look like and sound like what they want to hear. And so, you know how much, you know how much, um, if you were to put a chocolate chip cookie, how much Rat poison, do you need to put in that cookie for it to kill somebody? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Oh, the cookie looks great, but you don't know it's laced with poison. And you can eat it. And you can say, oh, nobody told me there was any poison in it. Of course, they're not going to tell you there's any poison. They're trying to kill you. Right? <laughs> they're not going to tell you that. Just like a thief. And Satan is a thief. And he's not going to tell you that there's poison in the cookie. He's not going to tell you, oh, I'm just telling you half the truth. I'm just telling you half the truth. He's not going to tell you that. This is why when we take an oath before we go to court, right? To tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because a half truth doesn't help anybody. And if a thief is trying to steal from you, he's not going to say, hey, I'm coming. 
I'm not going to put up a sign and say, hey, I uh, hope you're not at home at 8 p.m. tonight because that's what I'm going to show up. And so Satan comes at us with temptations. He comes at us in ways we don't expect so that we might disbelieve God just enough to buy into what he's trying to sell us. I want you to understand that temptation is Satan way, Satan's way of shortcutting God's plan and often produces a short-lived result and a short-lived life. You want to know why a lot of people die early? Because they take the temptations. They buy into it. And listen, there is nothing more than Satan wants for your life than for you to not fulfill what God planned for you. That's what, that's what makes Satan happy, is whenever you end up settling for something less than what God wants. And so he uses temptation to do this. The sad thing is, is we have a lot of Christians who take the temptation. They take the bait. I guarantee you, those of you who are fishermen, right? It doesn't take, I mean, sometimes it's just a little piece of, piece of bait, right? Just put that little piece of bait on there, and you can get you a big old fish. And some Christians, all it takes is just a little piece of bait. We've got to be stronger than that. We've got to be smarter than these fish, right? Don't be caught. Look at this. Don't shortchange your life by taking a shortcut. You're a game changer, not a short changer. Anybody here want to be a game changer? Today we got the Super Bowl. Go Chiefs. <laughs> Go Patriots next year. Next year. It's always next year. But, but you know, the thing about it is this. There is no person who's going to play the game today, the biggest game of their life, who's going to say, Coach, I'm just going to sit on the bench. And when everybody else goes and plays uh, and we win, give me a ring. They're not, there's nobody who's sitting on the bench today who's not saying, Coach, I want to be in there. I want to be in the game. There's nobody who's going to be handed the ball today. I'm telling you, Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes. He's Mahomes. He's going to throw. He's going to play the game of his life today. But I'm telling you this. He is going to do all he can do to win that game. And we as Christians have got to be willing to do all that we can do to win the game. Don't shortchange your life by taking a temptation, by settling for something less than what God has for you. You don't have to do that. So let's look at this right here in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And right here, we're told that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the reason of being tempted by the devil. I want you to understand that if Jesus was tempted, you're going to be tempted. Don't think that you are so spiritual You've been a Christian for such a long time that you're going to somehow outgrow temptation. There are many of us in this room who have been Christians for a long time, and I'm telling you that there are still some temptations that I have and I face that I've been facing all my life. And we're going to talk about Joseph in a couple of weeks, but let me go ahead and give you a precursor to Joseph right here. Joseph said no. And the next day he said no. And the next day he said no again. And he kept saying no. And you're going to have to get to a point in your life where you're going to keep saying no. Because temptation is not going to stop just because you get older. You're going to have to say no today, tomorrow, and always. Don't think that it's just going to get easier because you get older. And those of us who are old now can attest to that fact. All right? Sometimes you get older and you know what? You get new and different temptations. Right? This is why a lot of people end up in midlife crisis. Right? And they're faced with a whole new set of temptations. So the Bible tells us here that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. 
And so if Jesus was tempted, we're going to be tempted. I want you to know, this is encouraging to me. That I'm not some weird, just person out there who's being tempted. You've probably had times when you felt like, man, I'm the only one who's dealing with this. Man, I'm the only one who's being tempted like this. No, you're not. You're not the only one. But if Jesus was tempted, you need to be expect to be tempted. Because Satan wants to bring you down. Satan wants your life to be meaningless. He wants your life to not bring glory to God. One of the interesting things to me here in this passage is that it says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. Um, like I said, we were doing this fast and I was very hungry. I, I felt like I was eating all the time. I mean, I was eating tons of nuts and, you know, fruit. And then, you know, an hour later, I'm eating more nuts and more fruits. An hour later, I'm eating just more. I'm just like, oh my goodness, you know, this, this fast is making me hungry. But you know, the, Jesus was not eating anything. You go 40 days. Some of us can't even go 40 minutes without eating, Right? I mean, yeah, I know. It's like y'all, some of y'all are like, all right, preacher, you know, it's time to stop. We got to go eat. I mean, we're on a time schedule here, right? And it's like, we are accustomed to eating. And so here is Jesus who hasn't had anything to eat for 40 days or 40 nights. Nothing. It doesn't even say he had water. Now, he's a living water, so maybe he didn't need it. But, but you know, I mean, he didn't have anything. So this guy, Jesus, is completely, I mean, I'm talking about he is without food, without water. He's in the wilderness by himself. And then it says, oh, by the way, at the end of it, he's hungry. Thanks, Matthew. Captain Obvious. Yes, Captain Obvious here. He was hungry. But, but you know, when Jesus was fasting, I want you, I want you to understand this. That when you are feeling tempted, maybe what you need to do is fast and pray. Maybe the reason Jesus was able to go through these 40 days is because he was fasting and praying. Whenever temptation comes hard at you, maybe you need to change it up. And maybe you need to start going without because what temptations try to do is to get you to meet every desire, every, everything you want, you meet it on your own. But you see, when you fast and you pray, you start denying yourself of everything you want. And you say, God, it's not what I want. It's what do you want? Amen. And so, God, I can overcome temptation by denying myself instead of giving myself everything I want. So here is Jesus. And he's setting an example for us. Right from the very beginning of his ministry, he's setting an example for us. But look at when this happens. It does. It happens right at the beginning of his ministry. Flip back a couple of verses or another page. Look backwards to chapter number 3 and verse number 3. Well, we'll start in verse number 1. In the, in the days of John the Baptist came the Judean wilderness, uh, came to the Judean wilderness, and began to preach. He began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. So here's John the Baptist who comes out of nowhere and starts preaching this message of repentance. And then he meets Jesus, his cousin. And when he meets Jesus, his cousin, Jesus comes to him and says, Hey, John, I want you to baptize me. So look over in verse number 13. Then Jesus went from Galilee to Jordan to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John to try, tried to talk him out of it. And he said, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. Now listen to this. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. And then he was led into the wilderness. What is that telling us? It's telling us this. You may be more susceptible to temptation 
right after a moment of great success. Jesus just had this pinnacle moment in his life where his father says, this is my son whom I love. I am well pleased in him. He is doing what I want him to do. And all of a sudden, boom, temptation comes. Some of you, you may have had that experience where everything is going great. And then out of nowhere comes this temptation. Out of nowhere. I mean, you're blindsided by something. I'm not saying this to scare you. But I do want you to understand that when you have a great moment with God, this is why when we do camps and things like this, we tell kids all the time, we're like, look, you're having a mountaintop experience right now. But when you get back to the real world, Satan is going to be there. Ain't much going to change except you. You're going back to the same problems, same family, same situations, and you're going to be hit hard. So I want you to understand that temptations often come to us after moments of great success. So be prepared. How are you preparing to handle temptation? You've heard this before. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. What's your plan? Many of you have fire alarms in your house, right? When that smoke, I was cooking my chili the other night, it was browning my hamburger. I'm in the basement, and I was like, oh, man, I, I'm smoking up this place down here. I better turn this. I better turn my fan on, right? But you have a fire escape. You have a fire alarm so that when something's not right, you've got a way to get out. You know where to go. What do you, what's your plan for when temptation comes? Do you know where to go? You, do you have a way to get out? Are you prepared for it? Are you ready for it? Here is Jesus who just has this moment and all of a sudden he is now taken into this desert. And if Jesus was tempted, so will you. Temptation is a crossroad and every crossroad must be met with the cross. Are you prepared? When when Satan comes to you with an offering... This is what we have to do. Don't look at the temptation. Look beyond it. Why is the temptation so enticing? It's because it's all about what's right here, what's right now. What is going to make me feel good? What's going to make me happy right now? But Jesus was willing to look beyond the temptation and he saw the cross. And he said, I am not going to settle for something right here and right now because I'm looking forward. I'm looking ahead at what really matters. And for us, as followers of Jesus, when temptation comes and we're tempted with worldly, earthly things, we have to be willing to look beyond that and say, what's eternally important? It's not what's going to make me feel good right now. It's what is going to matter in eternity. So every time a temptation comes to you, let me encourage you to look beyond it. Temptations often come after great success. You need to be aware of this too. That temptation, you don't have to go looking for it. It'll come looking for you. Isn't that true? (laughs) Isn't that true? Some of y'all, especially students at school, right? You're like, oh no, I, 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 I didn't really mean to do it. Yeah, it's because you ended up hanging out with a certain group of friends, right? They came looking for you. They're trying to find a way to make something happen. Those of us who've been reading the Bible app, and let me encourage you to keep reading the Bible app, but the other day we were reading about Moses was up on the Mount Sinai, right? He's getting the Ten Commandments. He's up there for a while. So what do the people do? They say, hey, Aaron, make us a God. So Aaron's like, okay, good idea. Wrong, Aaron, bad idea. But Aaron's like, okay, so everybody just bring me your gold. Bring me all this stuff. And, and so he does it. He, he gets all their gold and he puts it in the fire. He makes them this golden calf to worship. Moses comes down. Moses has got a little bit of a temper problem. Understandably, he's righteous anger, right? He comes down and he's like, what are you doing? What are you guys doing? He comes to Aaron and he said, well, the people, they brought me all their stuff. And I threw it into the fire and out popped this golden calf. It just happens. <laughs> It's just, it's amazing. It just formed this golden calf and just flew out. And so everybody started worshiping it. Now that's ridiculous, right? 
But, but what Aaron was saying was this. It just happened, right? Look, temptation comes looking for you. The Bible says that the devil is like a lion seeking someone to devour. He's looking for an in. And if you're not careful, if you give him an inch, he will take a mile, right? There's an old sermon that goes like this. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. And, and so I want, to, I want to remind you that temptation, don't play with temptation because you will pay with regret. Don't play around with temptation because it is going to cost you one way or the other. It's going to cost you mentally. It's going to cost you emotionally. It might cost you relationally. So don't play around with temptation because it's really not worth it. It's not worth it in the end. So prepare for temptation. Let me give you, you know, there's, there's this coronavirus going around and... and it's not from drinking Corona, okay? Let me just clear that up. Not that I would ever know that, but I know there were some people who were asking before, you know, where, where did they get that name from, Corona? I don't know where they get these names from. But I'm going to tell you about an, another disease. It's called THABS. Some of you may be suffering from THABS. Let me, let me fill you in what THABS is, all right? You're most likely to encounter temptation when you have THABS. When you're tired, hungry, alone, bored, or successful. <laughs> and so I want you to understand that if you're in a situation like this, where you find yourself tired, you better prepare. Because temptation is going to come looking for you. When you're hungry, you better get prepared because temptation is going to come looking for you. If you're alone... And if you're alone too long, in the darkness, on your computer, temptation is going to come looking for you. A pop-up is going to pop up. Right? I'm just saying, you don't have to. You, it's going to come looking for you. If you're bored. How many of you teenagers have gotten in trouble? Y'all remember when you were a teenager, you got in trouble just because you were bored. Just looking for something fun to do. Just want to have a little bit of fun, right? And that little bit of fun leads to a whole lot of trouble. And then success, as we've been talking about. That when you are successful, you open yourself up to a whole lot of other temptation. So you've got to be prepared for this. Satan knows your weaknesses, and you need to know your weaknesses. Don't act like you don't have them. You do. Only a fool would say, I don't have any weaknesses. I'm strong enough. What does that tell you? Pride comes before a fall. So be careful. Are you suffering from thabs? Are you tired, hungry, alone, bored, successful? Because that is a virus that will kill you. Be careful. Be careful. Margaret Thatcher said, you may, have to fight a, a, you may have to fight a battle more than once to win it. And you know what? Some of us are going to fight many battles if we want to win. But you've got to stay in the fight. Don't shortchange your life. Don't give in too soon just because it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Life is hard. But you can't give in. Don't quit. But I want to also encourage you with this, that just because you're tempted doesn't mean you've sinned. Temptation and sin are two different things. Even the strongest Christians are tempted on a daily basis. Temptation is not sin. So when does it become a sin? That's, that's always a big question. When, when do I know that I've sinned? Well, usually it works this way. You look once, that's not, that's not a sin. That's a temptation. You look twice, well... That's another story. Right? It, it's, it's when you begin to linger. It's when you begin to think about it. You contemplate it. You are on a dangerous line of crossing over into sin. Temptation is going to come at you all different ways and forms and fashions. Sometimes things happen and you just, you're not even aware of what's going on. That doesn't mean that you've sinned. <clears throat> but 
Temptation does lead to sin. Oftentimes, it comes down to a choice. What are you going to do when the temptation comes to you? What are you going to do? How are you going to handle it? You have to make a decision. Temptations are not from God. This verse tells us in Matthew chapter 4, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, but that's not into sin. Why would God lead his son into the wilderness to be tempted? I want to submit to you, you know, it says, how long was he there? 40 days and 40 nights. God likes the number 40 for some reason. What else do we know about 40? Noah was in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. And, and they were in the wilderness for 40 days, I mean, for 40 years. Uh, they were wishing it was 40 days. For 40 years, they were in the wilderness. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I told you that when Jesus came out and he was talking, he did the Sermon on the Mount, right? Why did he go up on a mountain? He went up on a mountain because he was saying, hey, I'm the, I'm the other Moses. I'm the better Moses. I've come to give you not just the law, I've come to fulfill the law. So here is Jesus who is saying, hey, I'm just like Moses. Moses was, you know, he had to lead the people for 40 years in the wilderness. But Jesus says, I've come to do in 40 days what Moses couldn't do in 40 years. Right? And Jesus said, so I am the better Moses. And he said, I have come to fulfill what Moses and the people couldn't do. They, they wandered. And Jesus was directed. Jesus had a purpose and a plan. And I want you to understand that when you know what your purpose and your plan is, it's going to help you overcome temptation. You, you don't have to take everything and every option that comes your way. Sometimes the best thing you can do is minimize your options. I get so frustrated when I go to Redbox and people haven't made up their mind with what they want to see. I'm like, why are you, you hadn't decided what you wanted yet, and you're going to make me stand out here for 30 minutes so you can make a decision. You've got to flip through every screen on there to find out what you want. And this is because there's so many options. There's so many options. This morning, I was running late. You know why I was running late? Because I had too many options of what to wear. <laughs> I, I changed like two times. And, 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 and so here's the thing, is that some of you, you, you got too many options, and it slows you down. When you limit your options and you say there's only one reason, only one thing to live for, you know what? You, you've made some other choices you don't have to make now. Amen. Begin limiting your options and you'll start seeing your temptation go down. Wow. But it's when we have so many options, temptations lead us into sin. Jesus was so focused on what he needed to do, he accomplished it without a problem. James 1, 13. Look at this. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, for God is not tempted by evil, and He Himself doesn't tempt anyone. You say, what's the difference between a temptation and a trial and a test? Well, that's a good question. Let me just put it this way. A temptation always seeks to bring out the worst. A test always seeks to bring out the best. Test best. When a teacher gives you a test, are they, they, do they want you to fail? Some of y'all are like, yeah, my teacher does. My teacher wants me to fail. <laughs> no, your teacher wants you to study. <laughs> That's why they give you a test, so that you will study. Today, we have a verse test for our, our wave team people. They've been freaking out. You know? well, I've been telling them, hey, a test is coming, test is coming, test is coming. You need to be prepared. Be prepared. Test is coming. Teacher tells you, test on Friday. If you're not ready for the test, that's not the teacher's fault. That's your fault. You had warning. So a teacher gives you a test because they want to see what you know. Always trying to bring out the best in you. A temptation, however, is seeking to bring out the worst in you. Remember when Jesus was talking to Peter? And he said to Peter, he said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. Do you, do you know what sifting is? When you sift something, right, you, you have a sieve. And when you do it, you shake it, right? And what stays on the top? 
the impurities stay on the top. Satan has desired to sift you. He wants the impurities to stay on the top. He wants that to be what everybody sees. You see, when a temptation comes to you, Satan is trying to say, let's let what remains be the impurities. Let's let that be what's seen in you. But Jesus said this, but hey, Peter, I prayed for you. And when you come back to faith, you go and you teach everyone. You see, Jesus knows that we are going to struggle. At times, we're going to fail. We're going to sin. But I praise God for the times when He has covered my iniquities. For the times when He has covered my impurities. For the times when He has not allowed those things which are so ugly and devastating to be seen by everyone. Amen. That is the grace of God. Satan has desired to sift each one of you. He wants the ugly things to be what is seen. I want to encourage you and challenge you. Say no to temptation so that God's glory may be seen. So that God's holiness might be seen in your life. And so as we wrap up today, I want you to know that temptation is not from God. A trial is meant to be used to purify Right? A trial, we often see it in the Bible talking to fiery things, right? A fiery trial may come into your life. When we heat up gold, we heat up silver, it purifies that. And the stuff that rises to the top is called dross. It's all the impurities there. And what does the refiner do? He scrapes off the impurities so that everything that remains is pure. When God allows a fiery trial to come into your life, it's not, it's not for any other reason than to purify you, to make you clean, to help you become more a representation of God in this world. And so let me give you a couple of helpful things for this week as we wrap up. Be accountable. If you want to overcome temptation in your life, you're going to need to be accountable to somebody. And here's why. Because you're not strong enough by yourself. If you were strong enough by yourself, some of these temptations you've been dealing with, you wouldn't have been dealing with for so long. But you're going to have to make yourself accountable to somebody. All right? Jesus went into the wilderness and he was praying for 40 days and 40 nights. He was accountable to the Father. And he said, Father, whatever your will is, that's my will. I'm not going to give in to a shortcut. And next week we're going to look more specifically at the three temptations that Jesus faced in this matrix. But for us this week, let me encourage you, be accountable to someone because you are not strong enough. Listen, when God gives you an out, you better take it. When God gives you an out, when you have Holy Spirit inside of you saying, hey, this is not a good place, not a good scene, this is not your scene, you need to get out of here before it gets obscene, right? You need to get out. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Do what God wants you to do in that moment. And finally, give God three minutes. Three minutes. Now, if I were to stand up here for three minutes and just holding this mic, y'all would be like, that's the longest period of time ever. But I want you to know when you're in a temptation, three minutes isn't that long. And so I want you to do this. I want you, the next time you're feeling tempted, give God three minutes. Give God the Father a minute, Jesus the Son a minute, and Holy Spirit a minute. (laughs) And in those three minutes, this is what I want you to be doing. Contemplate your consequences. Think about the future. Don't be impulsive because that's what happens, right? We get impulsive. We say, oh, I got to make a decision now. No, yeah. Most of the time, whenever temptation comes, you got a little bit of time to think and pray. You You got some minutes. You don't have to make an immediate decision. But if you, I promise you this. If you will take three minutes, if you will take three minutes, somebody will call. It might even be a robocall. But that might be God's way of getting you out of some temptation. Answer the call. Somebody might show up. Something could happen. Listen, every time when I've been in temptation and I'm just like, uh, I'm debating things. And you know what? You know who calls me? My mom. Right? And, and so I want you to understand, God's going to use people in your life, right? When you might be facing a temptation where you're going to, if you will give God three minutes, 
and you will seriously pray and you will seriously take that time and say, God, what is the right decision for me? Most of you already know the decision. But you just want some confirmation. And I'm telling you this, if you will give God three minutes, you'll be surprised at how God will deliver you out of temptation if you're serious about overcoming. Look at what this verse tells us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. That means this. If you're dealing with temptation, well, welcome to the family. Everybody's got to deal with it. But God is faithful. And He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able That means this, if you're being tempted with something, you can't say, oh, it's just too much for me. No, it's not. If the temptation has come to you, God is saying, well, you're able to handle this temptation. The problem is, you don't want to say no. That's the problem. It's not that you can't say no, you don't want to say no. You're able to handle it. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. If God gives you an escape, it's your responsibility to take it. So many people are like, well, God didn't deliver me. God gave you two legs. They still work, don't they? You can get out of it. Why are you expecting God to come and do something miraculous when He's already saved you? That's miraculous, right? And He gave you a will, and you just need to exercise it. And the reason some of us are so flabby in our mind is because we have not exercised that muscle. If you start exercising that muscle, you will be stronger. And the more you say no, the easier it will be to say no. Those people who are dealing with addictions in the past, I'll tell you this, what's the hardest time? Right when you first quit, that's the hardest time, isn't it? Because your body, your mind is craving it, and you just want it. And it's like, this is the hardest thing. Endure it. Get through it. Give yourself three weeks, and you'll see. It's a whole lot easier to say no now, because I've gotten that pattern of saying no. But you've got to get into that habit of saying no to your flesh. Saying no to yourself. And so, as we enter into this temptation matrix, let me remind you again, don't play with temptation because you'll pay with regret. Don't play around with it. Your life is too important. Be accountable to someone. If you need help, get help. This is why the church exists. Because God wants your life. He wants to use your life. And your life matters. Let's pray. So God, as we uh, have looked at your word today, I pray, Father, that you would help us when we're tired and hungry, alone, bored, successful. When we've given ourselves to you, pray, God, that we would submit ourselves, our will, our desire to you also. It's not easy sometimes facing temptation on a daily basis to say no. And there are some of us in this room who may have felt like we've gone too far. That, that because we've been sinning or because we've been tempted in so many ways that it's just easier to give in. But God, I pray that you would help everyone in this room to realize the value of their life. That God, you love us right where we are. And that when we come and give ourselves to you, you will equip us, you will empower us to do that which we cannot do on our own. Lord, willpower is not enough. We need the Holy Spirit's power in our lives. So church today, guests today, friends, family today, Let me ask you this. Do you have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Is is God alive in you? Because if He's not, you're not going to be able to overcome temptation and sin. It's only through the power of God's Spirit that we can overcome. So today, if you've never given your life to Jesus, 
this is the place to start. Holy Spirit has to live inside of you to equip you to do that which you can't do on your own. So why not just cry out to Him now and say just a simple statement. Dear God, dear Jesus, I need you. I need you to change me. If you're praying something like that, if you're calling out to Jesus right now in this moment, I want you to know there's a holy transaction happening. And that through his word, God has told us that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you and he will begin to help you overcome temptation. But that's where it starts. If you're making that decision today, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to pray with you. Please just make me aware or make someone around you aware that today you're taking that step so that we can celebrate with you. Christian, how do you need to be accountable? How do you need to be prepared? This week when temptation comes, are you going to give God three minutes? Make that decision right here and right now, God. Help me to be the man, to be the woman that we need to be. To honor you in every decision that we make that we would honor and glorify you through our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.